Welcome to Spreadsheet Geek. In this video, we'll talk about statistical skew. As our data set, we'll use the returns of the S&P 500 component companies in 2019. By the end of the video, you'll understand how to use Excel's skew function and how to interpret the result. You'll also understand the difference between positive and negative skewness. But most importantly, you'll gain a valuable insight. You'll understand why it is so difficult to pick a subset of the S&P 500 and actually beat the S&P 500 index. This video was made using Microsoft Excel 2019. This is a normal distribution. If it were a perfectly symmetrical distribution, three values would occur where the dashed line intersects the horizontal axis. One is the mode or the most frequently observed observation in the data set. Another is the median or that observation which separates the top half from the bottom half. Finally, there's the mean or the average of all observations. A perfectly symmetrical distribution is said to have a skewness of zero. Skewness is a measure of asymmetry in the distribution. The distribution shown in red is asymmetrical. The mode of this asymmetrical distribution is shown with the red dashed line. There are a greater number of observations to the right of the mode than to the left. This distribution is said to be positively skewed. If there were more observations left of the mode, it would be negatively skewed. The mode, the median, and the mean occur in different places on a distribution with skewness. The median will be to the right of the mode on a positive skew, and the mean will be even further right. The mean is more sensitive to skew than the median. As stated previously, this distribution has a right or positive skew. If we flipped everything around left to right and presented a mirror image of this distribution, it would have a left or negative skew. What we're going to do now is plot a distribution of the 2019 returns of the individual companies of the S&P 500, and we'll see if it's symmetrical or not. The companies with the highest Individual returns will be to the right, and the lowest returns or negative returns will be to the left. Before I go any further, I need to issue a little disclaimer. If you go to Wikipedia's page on the S&P 500 companies, you can get an up-to-date list of the 500 approximate companies that are in the S&P 500. And if you go down about halfway, you'll come to selected changes to the list of the S&P 500 components. And here, if we go to 2019, let me see the first entry was on January 2nd, 2019, we had an acquisition. And then there's a company that went bankrupt and had to be replaced. This is the column with the company added and this is the company that was replaced. So there were multiple replacements and acquisitions throughout the year that led to a new uh, component being added to the index. The index is also rebalanced quarterly to make sure that the market capitalization proportion of each company is correct. So this makes determining the return of the individual components kind of difficult because we have components being swapped out throughout the year. So I found a website that gives me a pretty close approximation of the 500 companies that stayed in the index for the whole year. This is the website I'm going to use for my component returns for the S&P 500. And I'm not actually going to use the S&P 500. This company uh, puts together data and sells it. Uh, there are other companies like it. I'm not giving them an endorsement, but they do uh, 
provide you with the opportunity to grab these returns from these companies for the last five years. They very carefully state these as the top 500 companies, kind of ambiguous. Uh, it implies that this list would be very similar, but not exactly the same as the S&P 500 component list. Although they do list some S&P 500 data uh, up here in this paragraph. I'm gonna use this data. I think this data will be close enough to the S&P 500 and certainly close enough to prove the point I'm trying to make. So I pulled my data into a spreadsheet and I went ahead and I sorted from the worst return to the best return way down at the bottom. And by the way, there's only 495 companies on this list if you don't count the, the header row there. The first thing I wanna do is highlight all of those returns and I'm just gonna plot those on a histogram type of chart. So let's insert one of those and see if we can get an idea of what our distribution looks like of just the returns of the individual companies. And I'm gonna just call these the uh, 2019 company returns since this really isn't the S&P 500. I'm gonna do a couple things to this histogram. One is if you click on the lower axis, the horizontal axis, and then right mouse click, you can't see this, it's a little off the screen, but one of the options is format axis. And I wanna change the number of bins to something smaller. I don't want this many subdivisions of these ranges. I think 12 will be a re, uh, more reasonable number. So I'm gonna set that to 12. And I'm also going to right mouse click on one of the bars and add data labels. So I can see how many uh, components are in each one of these groupings. So as you can see, we have one, uh, one way out here to the right. This is a, a very strong individual company that performed very well in the 131 to 148% up bracket. That'll be down at the bottom of our list. And it looks like Advanced Micro Devices was that company. And then up at the top here, we've got some poor performers. The top four here are headed by PG&E. That was the company that set off that bad fire in California. So they're uh, going through bankruptcy, down 54%. And that's a nice symmetrical distribution for the most part. I wouldn't call this any significant tail off to the right. Now I wanna look at this one other way before we go any further. Let's move this one down and I'm going to chart this one more time. This time I'm going to insert a, uh, a bar chart. We'll make that as big as we can get it. And label that correctly. So looking at this, it was a very good year for the S&P 500. The S&P 500 was up over 30%. The, as an index, uh, but you'll see that you have a lot of strong returns here on the right end of the chart, a lot in the middle and, and a few negative returns down this way. If you were randomly picking say 50 stocks out of these pr approximately 500, you'd probably get a two or three down here, but the other 47 or 48 would be up here. And if you're lucky, you'd get one of these toward the, the, the far right end. And you would do probably pretty well. The problem with that thinking is that you're equal weighting each company. So if we look at our distribution of returns here, each company is a little sliver about that wide. There's two slivers, there's nine, there's 148. And this is not the way the S&P 500 index works. The S&P 500 is a market cap weighted index. We need to weight 
these returns according to the size of the company if we want to see what we're up against in terms of beating the S&P 500. And this will show the true skew of the market. So I need to find more data. I need to find the market capitalization of each of these companies so that I can use that to weight these returns properly. And remember, the S&P 500 weightings are rebalanced four times a year each quarter. So it's kind of a moving target, but I came up with a pretty decent solution. There are many ETFs that track the S&P 500 companies, and I found one of them that lists the weighting of each company at year-end 2019. This is the website for the iShares Core S&P 500 ETF, and this ETF tracks the S&P 500. If you scroll down to Holdings, you get a listing of holdings and you can select from a few dates, including December 31st, 2019, and actually see if you scroll down what the weighting was. And this looks like it's sorted from the biggest weight to the smallest. I'm sure this is Apple computer. And very conveniently, there's a little download button here and I'll just hit that. When you open that file up, it looks like this. So we've got a lot of information here, but we really only need the ticker symbols and the weights. So I'm going to run a VLOOKUP for my weights. And that'll go like this. Look up the ticker symbol over here in column number six. And that's pulling in a weight. That would be one one hundredth of a percent of the weight. So even though this company had a very strong return for 2019, it's not gonna count for much because it's one one hundredth of the weight of the S&P 500. I'm going to call this next column weighted returns. And that'll simply be this times this. Let's auto fill those down. So note that my weights, if I just highlight that column, add up to exactly 100%. My weighted returns, if they accurately reflect the annual return of the S&P 500 index, which again, we know we're not going to be exactly the same, but they should add up, even though there's some positive and negatives in here, they should add up to 31.49%. Let's see how we did. We're coming in at 33.7%. So we're a little off, but we know the reasons why we're off because our listing of companies does not exactly reflect the S&P 500 index, but we'll accept that. So what I'm going to do is resort this whole thing one more time for weighted returns over here. And we'll go small to large. And then I want to do another bar chart. Like the second chart I did. Now I'm going to make this a little bigger and go into full screen mode. I've made my chart as big as I can possibly make it to emphasize a couple points. This is the weighted market return chart showing individual returns of our market, which is 495 companies. You'll notice that the one company on the far right, which happens to be Apple Computer, contributed over 4% of this market's total 33% return for the year. The next one contributed a full 2.5%. 
And this is a 495 company market. The next one was 1%. I believe that's Facebook and then Chase Bank and then Amazon. This should illustrate to you more than anything else how picking stocks is very difficult. When you're picking from a 495 stock market, you better pick some of these at the far right or you are going to underperform the market most likely. This chart illustrates the skew of the market. It is extremely positively skewed and we'll calculate that skew in a minute. But the thing you should take away from this is that it's always been this way. Back in the 20s and 30s, it was AT&T, General Electric, General Motors, and then later on IBM that were the Apples, Microsofts, Facebooks of today that were totally carrying the weight of the market. This is nothing new. Before we calculate the skew of the market, we need to put it in perspective. A skew of negative 0.5 through 0 to positive 0.5 is considered fairly symmetrical. Skewness in the range of negative 1 to negative 0.5 or positive 0.5 to 1 is considered moderately skewed. Skewness less than negative 1 or greater than positive 1 is considered highly skewed. There's a formula for skewness, but we'll let Excel do the work for us. First, I'll calculate the skew of the regular returns before waiting. It's very simple. You just highlight your data. And we come up with a skew of about 0 0.20. Remember, skews of less than 0.5 are not considered very skewed at all. This number really has no meaning if you're investing in the S&P 500 index, but it could have meaning to the person who invests in an equal weight S&P 500 exchange traded fund. And I know there is at least one such fund in existence. This would uh, accurately reflect the skew of returns of that fund. Now for the weighted returns. Remember, we said a skew of greater than one is considered very significant. And I've got an extra number there. So I'm coming up with a skew of over 12.6. That is the skew of our weighted returns. In this example, one company, Apple Computer, accounted for over 4% of our market's 33% total return. That's over 12% of the weight of the market being carried by one company. The best way to ensure you get full coverage of all the companies out at the far right end of the bar chart is to invest in the whole index. In my opinion, picking a subset of the S&P 500 for investment is called active management and active management in study after study has been shown to be no different than random picking by a chimpanzee or by darts thrown at a list of companies. When you factor in management fees on top of the already high hurdle of beating the market through stock picking, it's no surprise that in a recent study, about 95% of all active managers failed to beat the index they drew stocks from over a 15 year period. I hope this video has helped enlighten you a little. If you've liked the content of this video and would like to see more like it, please hit my subscribe button. Thank you for visiting Spreadsheet Geek.